The internet has opened an old traditional craft up to the world, where the techniques are being taken in different directions, including into the world of art. Now we have a worldwide gathering, the Global Rug Hub. Rug makers are now coming together from around the globe on social media to connect with each other without having to leave their homes. This event takes it one step further. Let's meet some of them. I love rug hooking. It's very peaceful, meditative, just pulling these loops. I love the designing part too. Some days you just need to do something that is creative, get your mind off of other things. As far as my designing, I, I just draw what's in my heart and work with that. Often, like I said, it's nature. And I love to hook with others. In Florida, I have a group of ladies that I've been teaching. And uh, we have a great time hooking together. It's harder being on the road because I don't have hooking buddies, but I'm meeting people everywhere I go. Um, we were in Nova Scotia, and I, I met a lot of rug hookers up there, and that was a lot of fun. The big question all my rug hooker friends ask me is, where do you keep your wool stash in an RV? Well, there's supposed to be a washer and dryer in here, but there's not. It's all rug hooking. I had been a ceramic artist for about 30 years. That was my profession. I had taken ceramics about as far as I was going to take it, and I needed a new challenge, and that's when my friend Maggie introduced me to rug hooking, and um, it just grabbed me as something that I thought I could, I could run with. My work is really their abstract wall paintings really. So through my exhibitions, the other day I did a, a floor talk at the Canberra Museum and Gallery about my work. So I, I'm spreading the word in that way, I suppose. I'm very used to working on my own. Um, in fact, I prefer that and then just joining up with a group when it's, you know, sociable. I think in terms of um, moving into a creative direction with, with the rugs, yeah, they they moved off the floor fairly quickly and onto the wall, which gave me more scope to be a bit more creative, edging and hang, the way they hang and drape and things. I think um, in the past, textiles were sort of poo-pooed as a bit of, you know, women's craft and, and given a fairly low status, I think, from the galleries. There's certainly um, an interest in you know, Indigenous sort of textiles. I've noticed in galleries they started to spark a little bit of interest in textiles in general. Miriam Miller says anyone can make a rag rug, a child, an adult, an artist, or someone with not an artistic bone in my body. It's cheap and easy because very little special equipment is needed. Absolutely any fabric can be used for rag rugs. Track suits, skirts, t-shirts, woolen blankets, suits evening wear and knitted jumpers. The only rule is to use stronger fabrics for floor rugs and the flimsier materials for use in wall hangings. I've been hooking since 2006. I live in the Highlands of Scotland in a town called Dingwall and don't belong to a specific rug hooking group. However, I, I feel I belong to many groups around the world via Facebook and that has opened up a whole new world for me and I value all the friendships that I make through this. I actually hook on my own. There are no rug hooking groups as such in the Highlands. However, this um, past six months, I have had the pleasure of teaching two separate groups of ladies to rug hook, beginners rug hooking. And uh, hopefully some of those people will um, think this is for me. I love rug cooking, a never-ending challenge and a pleasure, and you meet such wonderful people like yourselves. Red flag, red flag. 30 different artists have gotten together here in Shimanus, BC to tell us how they feel about climate change, global warming. They've all hooked a little flag that we'll be exhibiting in different places. And today we're all coming together to have a hook in and sit back in and enjoy all our wonderful art. Okay, signing off from Shimanus, BC, Vancouver Island. The first rug I made was a hooked rug using an Irish hook on Hessian background. I sourced the wooden fabric from op shops, uh, jackets, skirts, trousers, etc. My design was based on my imagining the Australian landscape from an aerial perspective. Although I enjoyed the process, I found it quite tiring physically. Then I found out about the Oxford rug punching tool and I found it easier on my hands. 
I'm currently working on a rug on my Tapimatic rug making machine. It actually does the traditional Giordi's knot on traditional rug canvas. The head makes the knots for you. I also make woven rag rugs on a weaving loom and really enjoy doing that as well. I'm a contemporary rug hooker. I hook in a loose organic style with a combination of new and recycled wool and commercial and hand spun yarns on linen. I love the contrast between the wool strips and the linen. In the past year, I've also learned to spin on an Ashford Kiwi 2 spinning wheel, and I love using the chunky hand-spun yarns in my rug hooking. Most of my mats include some aspect of the chakra color system as well. Along the way, I developed a whole new method of designing and hooking my mats, which became what I call healing mats. Writing and the Healing Mats led to my first two books. The first one is One Loop at a Time, a story of rug hooking, healing, and creativity. And the second is One Loop at a Time, the creativity workbook. Fumio Hachiska travels extensively and is an accomplished photographer. From her photographs, she makes black ink drawings and often uses the photos and drawings as inspiration for her rug designs, which she hooks with finely cut fabrics, quite often from recycled kimonos. My name is Pat Parsons and I am with Hooking Matters here in Gander, Newfoundland. I've been hooking about 15 years and this is my latest project that I'm working on. Traditional Newfoundland pattern with boats and lake houses and clothes on the line. Hi, I'm Mary Bird with the Gander Hooking Matters group. I've been hooking now about endlessly. This is a mat called Saltbox Houses, a traditional Newfoundland outport scene with an iceberg in the background, which is very common in Newfoundland and Labrador. There are seven of us, and we meet monthly, taking turns to host in our own homes. We always have tea and homemade cake. We're a closed group because we wanted to stretch ourselves creatively and to plan events and adventures, and that isn't always easy in a larger group. We decided to write our book, Doing What We Can, which is a miscellany of musings on living a creative life and is full of rugs and textile work, as well as our exhibitions and events. We're passionate about continuing to show younger people the art of rug hooking and the joy to be found in handwork. We make a lot of rugs to raise money for charities and we all have rugs everywhere. Elevating the craft of rug making to an art form is extremely important to us. To prepare for the virtual hook-in, we did a video visiting with uh, two of our members who have quite a bit of history. And one of the things we learned through that visit is that you often will have a rug that really gives you a strong sense of accomplishment. It may not be the prettiest of the bunch, but there's something in it that really, really appeals to you. So we then went back to the group, uh, our members, and asked them to bring in examples of those rugs. There was a wide variety of folks who brought in their first rug, a uh, rug that has a strong emotional attachment for them, or just one of the best things they've ever done. I say to all the ruggers out there, it is such a friendly, welcoming craft that anybody can do and take it in any direction. So it's not precious or excluding. Um, we like the fact that people are talking about how to take it into the future. We tend to make a lot of seat pads. I think locally and generally, the rugs are seen as a trip hazard, which is a great shame. So people are having less, less rugs on the floor and they're putting them up on the wall or doing fancy art stuff. I must say, everybody here, I think, is very generous with their skills. There's none of this sort of, well, you can't know my techniques and I'm not going to tell you my special dye formula, etc. No, I think that as people um, start to work less because their jobs are getting aut automated and robots come into the workplace more and more, uh, we may actually have more spare time uh, that we can fill with artistic pursuits like rug hooking. Probably the direction that we're going because um, we need to have constructive innovative and interesting things to do with our spare time, you know, as we, as we get older. Heather started Rug Aid, a not-for-profit enterprise in Gambia, West Africa, to teach young blind people the art of rug making. 
They buy food, medicines, pay school fees through the sales of these rugs. Plus, it has given them importance in their communities, a purpose, and given them confidence. While some focus on traditional hooking, others are experimenting and pushing the possibilities for more contemporary pieces. Many do both and many things in between. Some are upcycling clothing, fabric, yarn, jewelry, and other found items. Others dye their own wools, design their own patterns. Currently, this fiber art is thriving and evolving, and at least for now, its fit in society seems solid and perhaps even growing. Our networks are no longer bound by geography. Sharing is global. The community is global. At its heart is a passion for creating with fiber and a hook or punch needle. Hakon Gronhensvold is a weaver and filter. He likes working with textiles and makes story rugs from his own drawings. His introduction to hooking was by some ladies who were demonstrating. They told him they could teach him in 15 minutes. In fact, that was the only instruction he ever received. Hakon uses some recycled wool material, but mostly new wool. He dyes the wool with Remazol dye and occasionally plants. Hakon believes when you're able to use the craft to express your own meanings, thought, feelings, and so on, then you are an artist. I try to be in the studio four days a week, and I aim to be in the studio working from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. When I walk through the studio door, I'm always filled with that sense of possibility. My earliest inspiration was Gloria Kraus, who experimented with materials and techniques. Really, from early on, I knew that rug hooking had great potential for exploration, for experimentation. I teach. I've been teaching rug hooking for over 20 years, and uh, I love teaching introductory level workshops. I also teach advanced level courses, and I also teach um, courses that focus on new materials and techniques. I have taught elementary school children how to rug hook, and the thing that I really liked about the elementary school children was that they were fearless. They had no hesitation. The other thing that I loved was how they approached design, and it was it's so straightforward. Um, if someone is passionate about soccer, they will draw a soccer ball. They don't question it. They don't hesitate. They don't look uh, to me for approval. They just do it. I grew up in a rural environment, learned my life skills as a Girl Scout, handmaking craft techniques from my grandmother and my mom. A decade of college and work in Boston broadened my awareness of others and global issues. I was introduced to rug hooking when someone brought a antique Grenfell mat into my framing business to be preserved. And then she taught me how to pull the loops. That was 25 years ago, and rug hooking has led me halfway around the world to Australia, Wales, several Canadian provinces, and the United States. Rug hooking provides a community base. History, traditions, connecting with past generations while I'm talking with and working in the present. My studio work is focused on exposing different audiences to techniques that they would perceive as grandma did that, or it's a rug to walk on. Most of the pieces are mounted to hang on the wall now. Immediately, the viewer values something on display as art. I use my visual creations to speak and advocate. I had to choose what message to spend hours, even months, developing. The human impact on our environment is what I chose. Why do I use rug hooking to communicate? It's because of memories, people, mutual respect for our work. It's tactile. It's a medium and technique I could quickly be gratified with the results and I am constantly challenged as an artist to explore different materials and methods. I encourage the viewer to document their process in journals, on audio, and photos with captions. Tell your story with your local community. Demonstrate, display, and enjoy. 
someone will pick up a hook because of you. I had done rug restoration for about 13 years before I even hooked my first rug. And I was doing quilt and hook rug uh, repair. I worked for Kate and Joel Kopp, who wrote a wonderful book. And in the back of the book, they have kind of little diagrams of the process. And so I, well, that's not so tough. So I would patch the holes and then fix it with old stuff from other rugs that were too far gone to be repaired. And so I sort of learned it that way, but I really like coming up with my own ideas. And I tend to be more abstract in my designs, even though I'm a big fan of American folk art. I mean, they are kind of abstracted themselves, but I don't really deal with figurative work too much or representational things. The only way you learn is by the mistakes you make. So if you make a lot of mistakes, it's like, yes, look at the chances you have to learn. If you, if you do it quote unquote, right all the way, or you play it safe all the way, you're never really going to expand or, or grow in any discipline that you have. My brother is a wood turner, and he turns these beautiful bowls, and I had suggested to him that maybe he could put a groove in the top of one of the bowls, and I would put in what I call coils um, around the top of it. I just find it really exciting. When I started, because I didn't have anyone around me, I was using recycled things. I mean, that was what I saw in the old rugs, and that was pretty much what I had available to me. Sure, there are some who really like to maintain a certain kind of quality of wool and whatnot. I, for me, I don't care what the material is. If it gives the result that I want, then that's what I'm going to use. From, I would say, the 1940s and earlier, you would see different materials being used. So uh, rayons and stuff began to get incorporated in it. Um, there were silk stockings. Silk is old silk stockings are really difficult. They're easy to hook but they are so difficult to repair if you need a needle and thread. And stuff in the um, 1800s, uh, there would be sweaters, old socks, long underwear, um, heavy coat fabrics. It was a real mix. Whatever was there was used. The way you store it, if it can't be stored, if it's mounted and it can be stored flat, it should be rolled around a, a tube of some sort so that they don't end up kind of making folds. The worst thing to do is to fold them in quarters. Roll it in. Uh, clean fabric to cover over it. You want air circulation. You roll it right side out and protect it from moisture and sunlight as best you can. My whole life is about fiber art and textiles. It's what I think about all day, every day, in one way or another. We've been around for almost a decade now. So in the beginning, I didn't see quite as many interesting combinations of materials and techniques as we do now. And a lot of that, uh, I think I credit to the younger generations of fine craft artists and artists because they are much less concerned about what techniques or what the method is for accomplishing their work. Younger people are so interested in making and doing with their hands. They're not hung up on that fibers have any kind of particular reputation or they're so unencumbered. They're free. They're just free. We can't expect younger people just to be interested randomly. If that's important, then we must engage them in a way that they can relate to that will be fun and interesting and lighthearted, finding ways they can make something. This is the thing. Not everyone's going to become a professional artist, but everyone can make something. And then some percentage of them will continue. Several museums, very well respected, are very open to fine craft uh, and contemporary fiber art and textiles. Almost anyone can come in and find a way to engage with the work. And that's not true of traditional museum work all the time. Decide what success is to you. What is success? Is success that you have, you know, a li a, like a lifestyle business where maybe you're selling at fine craft fairs and that kind of thing? Or is success that you are teaching workshops? Or is success that you, your work gets shown in museum and gallery shows? For example, I know some artists who do it all. So they'll take commission pieces, they create online courses, they teach workshops, they go and do artist residencies. That's great, but not everyone does all of those things or is equipped or wants to do all those things. If success is making a living as an artist, I think that's difficult. I mean, not impossible, right? A newer model I see a lot, um, especially with the Instagram growing so much, is people who can make their own work in whatever medium and sell the supplies for that. You have to start by deciding for you what is success. Because if you don't know what you want, how do you know when you've gotten there? When people ask me what they can do, I ask them, 
what percentage of your time do you spend on making sure you're marketing your work and yourself? Just having a site and having your work up there, having the information on the work, like the, what is the, what are the measurements? I think you have to do it all to find out what matters to you. And then when you really know what matters to you, let the other stuff go. And if other people are doing it successfully, that's okay. If that's not your space, find your own space, you know? Australia, Canada, England, France, Japan, Norway, Scotland, Spain, UAE and USA. Arts and Culture Centre, Library, CWA Hall. Groups generally meet once a week, once or twice a month. Some have a monthly meeting at the official location and also meet in between time at each other's homes. Most groups welcome new members. A couple were closed due to space limitation of creative endeavours. From friends or relatives, self-taught via books, DVDs or YouTube, workshops, private lessons. Some groups have accredited instructors who are members or arrange for an instructor to visit the group and give a workshop. People and groups indicated they were interested in passing on the craft, some by demonstrating in public places or giving lessons to beginners in libraries, schools or scout and guide groups. One said they were strictly a social group. Quite a few were interested in creating something different from the traditional and exhibiting their work in galleries. We would like to thank everyone who's contributed their time, photos and videos to this virtual hook-in. We have really been overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information you've been willing to share with us. And we will plan to hold another virtual webinar in the future. Just uh, not right away, please. Keep watching the Textile Rug Hub, both our Facebook and blog for information on when we will host another event. If you sent photos and videos that were not used during this short webinar, please know that we will be using your material. It may appear as a Facebook post, a blog entry, or as a special feature, so keep watching. If you have questions after this session, do please contact us through Facebook or the blog. We'd really like to know what you think. Thanks go to Susan Feller and Sauter Village for their participation and promotion of this virtual event during Rug Hooking Week 2019. We can't thank our producer Kira Mead enough for her skill in being able to figure out how to weave this video snapshot of rug hooking from around the globe. Special thanks also to Joe Fanko, who developed and drove the Global Textile Hub and demonstrated with patience and skill how networking works. Finally, from me, Judy Tompkins, I did what I was told, and I had a terrific time. Thanks again from the Global Textile Hub team.